the point that I'm going to make, and I will work on being brief, which will surprise anybody who knows me, um, is that I think if we think about the metaphor of beacon, it also means we need to know where to shine that light. And so I want to point to a couple of shadows before ending more positively. Many of you may have heard of the report that came from uh, a very similar healthcare system to ours, by no means identical, but with a lot of similarities in the United Kingdom, the Mid-Staffordshire report. How many of you have heard of or seen that, that report? Maybe not too many. The Mid-Staffordshire report, just a quick pricey on this, it's easy to Google and find out about. It's also on our, um, I'm part of the Association of Registered Nurses of BC. We've got a few uh, blogs related to it. But just briefly, what happened with the Mid-Staffordshire report, Mid-Staffordshire was the, uh, sort of the equivalent of what we might think of as a healthcare tr um, authority here in BC was a, a piece of the healthcare system in Great Britain where um, they had a series of fairly serious reports uh, rolling out because of really substandard quality of care. And that, those reports uh, evolved over a period of a few years with the penultimate report coming out in 2013 that was led by um, a QC lawyer called, whose last name is Francis, F-R-A-N-C-I-S. You'll often see it referred to as the Francis Report. And what it did was it chronicled some really demeaning, degrading, and um, also just plain incompetent levels of care that were being delivered far too systematically. And this, it, it affected all people, but it was particularly older people. So here's the shadow I want to shine the light on. What the report found, and in the um, summary report that Francis provided, um, the failures that, he fa that were found included an institutional culture which ascribed more weight to positive information about the service than to information capable of implying cause for concern. That was one, one key finding. Secondly, standards and methods of measuring compliance which did not focus on the side effects of a service to patients. So again, what was being measured was institutional processes, not, was, not what was actually the outcome for patients. Too great a tolerance of poor standards and of um, risk to patients uh, as well. So definite patient safety problems, that's the third uh, major finding. Fourth, a failure of communication and monitoring between the many agencies to ensure that their knowledge of concerns were reported. So there was a disjuncture of communication. Fifth, a failure to tackle challenges to the building up of a positive culture in nursing in particular, but also within the medical profession. So both those professions got severely, severely chastised for not taking action sooner. Although I will say, to be fair, there's been many commentaries on this, uh, that medicine and nursing did speak up, but perhaps not as effectively and as collectively as they ought to, but they, they were chastised in the report. And also, the uh, sixth finding was a failure to appreciate until quite recently, this was in 2013, the risk of disruptive loss of corporate memory and focus resulting from repeated multi-level reorganizations. Does that sound familiar? I hear, yeah, that was the one that got me finally, somebody's naming it. Um, so it's, it's not, I'm not here to say the healthcare system in the UK stinks and we're great. That's absolutely not the case. We have shared problems and I've, I've felt looking at that report like I'm looking into a mirror that it's a mirror we all need to look at because we're all at risk of having Francis Report types of findings without the kind of strategic action that we've been talking about all day. Um, the other, the final thing is that um, how, how we support management and administration, and there's certainly a great deal of um, difficulty for people in senior roles, but what happened was that um, financial imperatives were getting rewarded rather than quality of care imperatives. And so that, I think, is a, in, in this beacon metaphor, there's some dark water on the horizon that we're also living and need to be, I believe, very careful of. Um, another shadow, and I'm not going to end with shadows because that would be a bad way to end the day, but just also to say that we have other pieces of research that point to what we need to be careful about. And here, in terms of older adults, so I really want to point to um, the challenges to having quality end-of-life care in general acute care units or rehab units, that quality end-of-life 
is, is very difficult to achieve in terms of care delivery. And there's recently been a very compelling dissertation about how dying patients who are on acute medical wards are seen as not belonging and are basically, because they're not getting treatment, often getting the last of anything, let alone care. And this is, again, particularly our older adult population that is, ri is at risk. And so what um, I think this means is we need to take, I, I know that you're all here because you believe in this, we share these values. I'm just taking a yellow highlighter to the importance of us taking action on the kinds of initiatives that we have. Our residential care system is linked to our rehab system, is linked to our acute care system, is linked to our home care system. And we have challenges for older adults in all of those spheres. What makes me incredibly optimistic, and this will be my final point before turning over to some wonderful examples, is that we do have the capacity to have leadership within and between our professions, within our professional associations, within wonderful organizations like Tapestry and the affiliation with Providence Healthcare, uh, as well as our, our colleagues across the country, whether they're in Quebec or Saskatchewan, um, that we can build this kind of leadership together. We have seen today some wonderful examples about how to push back on the shadow that's shown to us by, by the Francis Report. And I think that the focus on needs and the empathy for our, uh, the people we provide care for who are, at, who are truly elders in the best sense of the word is phenomenally important. So I, I'm just so delighted to be here. And I'll turn over. That's the shadow part. Let's go back to the beacon part. Thank you very much. A true beacon of hope is the children. They are our future. And I introduced you this morning to our intergenerational class, uh, 20 grade six students, who Sherbrooke has been their classroom for the past year. And in preparation for next year's class, um, the class and the Saskatoon Public School Board have prepared a video. And um, when I was submitting my slides for this, and you do have pictures from this video um, in your, in your uh, handouts, uh, but in the meantime, they finish the video, and the narrators of the video are the children. And I couldn't think of a better group to tell this story. So let's have a look at the iGen video. Welcome to the iGen classroom at Sherbrooke Community Center. iGen is an intergenerational classroom experience for grade 6 students in Saskatoon Public Schools. Students spend the year at Sherbrooke Community Center learning through relationships with elders. iGen students learn by doing. Students take part in activities and programs that take them out of their classroom and into the community. Elders are the residents of Sherbrooke Community Center and iGen students are part of that home. Students and elders have the opportunity to form friendships and share interests with one another. The home school for the iGen classroom is a Cole College Park school. Every day we walk across the field to and from Sherbrooke. College Park provides us with the additional school programs and we are part of their community. iGen students work through the grade six curriculum just like other students. The only difference is we are doing some of our school work while connecting with elders. iGen students and elders get to know one another very well. We are part of the larger community and this feeling of belonging helps everyone to grow and thrive. Literacy mentor Dr. Jody Grant is a teacher who lives at Sherbrooke and is an example of an adult who we learn with in the iGen program. She spends time with us while we work on our reading, writing, and speaking skills. Sherbrooke is a living environment and you will find plants and animals all around the home. It's so much fun to spend time with the animals during the school day. At iGen, students get to be part of bigger projects that impact our city and even the world. Our class helped host We Scare Hunger event at Halloween. This project brought in money and food for the Saskatoon Food Bank and Learning Center. iGen is a place to find your skills and talents and practice them in a safe and accepting space. At iGen, we are becoming better human beings and learning skills and attitudes that will last a lifetime. iGen is a program that helps us balance our learning so we can 
become future leaders and caregivers. We are changing the world of the people who live at Sherbrooke. The elders of Sherbrooke, in turn, are changing us. Just like any other grade 6 classroom, we are working on our literacy and math skills. iGen students have the opportunity to leave the program prepared for grade 7 and beyond. Sherbrooke attracts people who work to create learning opportunities, and we are often invited to be a part of innovative projects such as the Intergenerational Writing Project and learning about health issues with nursing students. If you visit Sherbrooke during a school day, here is what you may see. Students working with the elders using technology. Students group working on their math or literacy skills. Students assisting in the art studio, community day program, or in the cafeteria. Students moving, talking, interacting, and having choice and voice in their learning. We hope you will apply to iGen so that you too can walk the halls of Sherbrooke and make the world a better place. It's been such an honor to be a part of this project. Um, I've been on the, the advisory committee uh, preparing for the students to come and then working through this year with the students here. And uh, although I may be retired, I'm still a member of the advisory committee, so it's been such a great pleasure. Um, so that's, that's I, Jen. Good afternoon, everybody. It's such a pleasure to be here and uh, bring some you know, really exciting uh, work that the Alzheimer's Society of BC is doing. Um, the, the theme of this conference of today fits so well because the theme or the tagline of the Alzheimer's Society is help for today, hope for tomorrow. And we really embody that in everything that we do and our help for today is reaching out to uh, individuals in the province who are impacted by Alzheimer's or dementia and through our first link program to connect them to the support and the services that they need. And our hope for tomorrow is looking at raising dollars for research to continue to support all the other uh, really essential work. It, it's always important to put up some of the, the key figures, and I know people have seen these, but it's always an important um, a, a moment to sort of stop and think about what we are really talking about. We know that over 70,000 people in this province have dementia or Alzheimer's, and that's really significant. And what is even more significant is that we know that almost 15% 15 of those individuals are under the age of 65. And if you stop and think about that for a minute, it means that all the mythology that sits around Alzheimer's, that it's an old person's disease, it's a normal part of aging, begins to actually be challenged. And so it's really important through education to start to think about what we can do about that. We also know that of those people in the province who have dementia, that over 60% of them live in the community. And if we again stop and think about that, that is incredibly powerful because we all live in the community. And what is a community? A community can be New Westminster, it can be British Columbia, it can be the library, it can be your book club, it can be a walking club. A community is a, a place where people come together. And so the idea that people who are living with dementia in the community, and that is where they want to be, it, it again is a very powerful idea about education. So the Alzheimer's Society of BC has an initiative that we are very excited about and we are wanting to start to spread this into the province and really begin to reach out. And that is the idea of a dementia-friendly community. And it's the idea that people want to be in their community, they want to be productive, they want to be where they've always been, where their supports are, where their routine is. And what we want to do is a culture shift about dementia. And so as we begin to think about what is necessary to shift the culture of people's views about dementia, it then becomes a dementia-friendly community. The, the, the idea of well is that for those individuals who have dementia and their, their families and their caregivers, we want an environment where they feel safe, they feel they, they can continue to access everything that they've continued to do, whether it's their bank, whether it's a grocery store, whether it's going for a walk. And for those people who live around them in the community, actually have a moment of thinking about what is the appropriate interaction. And that blends so well with so many other things that we do in our community, whether that's aging uh, living or aging, aging friendly communities, which is a really big initiative that I know many of you know about, whether it's about all the other ideas we do about people who live in a community and contribute together, no matter what our strengths are or no matter what our limitations are. 
The, the idea of a, a dementia-friendly environment is so that socially and physically and from all those safety factors, people come together and they are able to participate and bring their strengths together. It is an important thing to actually stop to look at people uh, in a community and, and talk with them what that means and how they can make a difference. Because as we heard today with culture change, it doesn't just happen. We have to start to take the myths and take the beliefs and start to challenge those and give people new ways of thinking and new skills to actually proceed. The, the dementia social, or the dementia friendly um, social aspect is about, again, what people need socially from a community. We all know one of the most important aspects of perhaps pr uh, prolonging a dementia, prolonging uh, Alzheimer's, is social interaction. We all need social interaction. People need to be able to go somewhere where they believe their stigma isn't going to precede them, that they're not going to be labeled. They also need to be able to go where they know they're going to be welcome for what they offer to the situation as opposed to what their lim limitation might get in the way. People want to be able to go to the grocery store and, and buy some milk and if they don't know what $2.50 means, they can feel comfortable that they can just put the change on the, on the counter and the cashier won't look at them oddly or think they have a problem but say, hey, I can help you, here's what it is. So that is the social interaction that we want to be really uh, looking at changing. From a physical perspective, it's really quite neat. We've talked with a lot of communities, a lot of municipalities across this, the province who want to actually really change their culture, really change the way that their city is interacting. And so a lot of the, the trend right now is to really adding creativity and innovation into different municipalities. But what has happened is often is what some of these great innovations and these great creative ideas have actually, actually caused barriers. And so on this slide, you'll see this idea of tulip chairs. And it, it really, actually, I was quite amazed that we found this on the website. But it, it's the idea that to, to make a, a city or a park look really quite innovative and creative, we put in these great ideas of where people can go to sit. But for people who have some limitations, which may be coming through dementia, they don't see the chair. They see the tulip. And so if they're out walking and they're feeling tired, there's nowhere for them to sit. So they may actually not go and walk in the park because they don't have a place to sit. So by simply providing a bench that looks like a bench, that someone can say, hey, there's a bench. I can sit on the bench. That's the idea, again, of bringing the, the, the new creativity of a, of a community, but also at the same time recognizing that there may be some limitations and how can we move around those barriers and work together. Dementia-friendly communities is really an idea that we have to really encourage people and um, look to, to get people to all step up to the plate. We all, again, own a bit of this, and we all probably are very open to the idea, but may not exactly know how to do that. And so there's ways that all of us can start to make a dementia-friendly community. It's simply by asking people if they need help. It's learning to communicate slowly and, and show much more compassion. It's looking to, to connect with people as opposed to correcting people. It's taking that moment to see a person while they're maybe struggling and thinking, you know, what, what, what can I offer there rather than judging or labeling or moving beyond? But the balance, too, is also recognizing that there are times when people really do need help. And so in emergency situations, such as wandering or emotional or physical distress, we need to reach out and get professionals to come in and help people. And it's understanding that difference. So as a community, we recognize that we care for everyone and we care for all of us. Dementia-friendly communities is, is an idea that I think that all of us in this room can really grasp and really embrace, and, and it really is looking to go to a number of different communities and really challenge them to step up and think about what their community can do. It's small steps that slowly build into a, a large momentum. This past February, we had a wonderful opportunity to meet with the City Council of New Westminster, and we trained the City Council, the Mayor, and all the City Councilors as dementia-friendly uh, individuals, as dementia friends, and they are the first City Council, as we know, probably in Canada, to be claiming themselves as a dementia-friendly community. And that is so exciting. And, and they, they reached out and they said, you know, there are ways that we can change our community, the city of New Westminster, and begin to make slow changes. And whether that's in our bylaws, whether that's in the way we talk about things, whether that's the way we can address things, we are committed to doing this. And since then, we've had a number of other municipalities from around the province step excuse me, step up and ask for the same support and training, as well as some other smaller uh, seniors organizations and um, community groups like that. 
But on Tuesday, this Tuesday, the Alzheimer's Society of BC is going to meet with the BC Legislative Assembly. And they have asked us to come in and train them to be a dementia-friendly community. And what a powerful statement that is, is that our own Legislative Assembly has put up their hand and said, we support the, the need to, to ensure that our province is dementia-friendly and that we are committed to this. And they want to begin by taking that leadership role of going through the training so that they are going to be leaders in their own communities as MLAs to move that forward. It's such a great m movement for for British Columbia and it's also a leadership role for Canada and I think it really fits in so nicely today with the beacon of hope because that is what we believe that this hope is going to move us forward and as we move forward we're going to take on the, ch the culture today of the stigmas that sit around dementia and Alzheimer's and really change that and it connects so nicely with the children because the hope is that one day as our children become the next adults and the next community members the idea and the stigma around Alzheimer's and community or Alzheimer's and dementia community just won't exist. So thank you very much.